In February 1966, I flew to Sydney to join my first ship, the MV Chakrata. She traded primarily between New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South and Western Australia and the Middle East. Sydney was usually the last port of discharge and the first port of loading for each voyage. Ship's holds were cleaned between final discharge and the commencement of loading and this gave us time to explore Sydney and surrounding regions. Arrival in Sydney Harbour saw us pass Fort Denison, the still under construction Sydney Opera House, sail under the Harbour Bridge and finally past Luna Park before berthing in Piermont. Moored on the north shore of the harbour, beneath Taronga Park, is the RAN's mothballed fleet, including the HMAS Quick Match. I was later to serve on her sister ship, the Queenborough, as a Navy Reserve Engineer.
Hiring a car and heading to Katoomba in the Blue Mountains to the east of Sydney was a popular R&R activity. Unfortunately, the weather was not always accommodating. The weather was kinder to us on a subsequent trip to Katoomba and the Janolan Caves. The Scenic Railway is the steepest railway in the world, according to the Guinness Book of Records, and was originally part of the Katoomba Mining Tramways constructed between 1878 and 1900. It descends through sandstone cliffs via a rock tunnel and then emerges to spectacular views and lush fern-filled rainforests on the valley floor. Just over an hour's drive from Katoomba and at the bottom of a very steep winding road into the Janolan Valley are the Janolan Caves.
Back on board the Chakrata, it was time to sail. This time, when the pilot left us, instead of leaving Sydney Harbour and heading south to Melbourne, we did an unusual port turn and headed north to Brisbane. The voyage from Sydney to Brisbane is about 36 hours long, with the opposed piston Doxford engine running at full sea speed. As an engineer's trip down memory lane, I've taken the liberty of inserting this YouTube clip of the twin engine Doxfords in the Ocean Monarch. Note the cooling water hoses on these engines instead of the swinging arm cooling connection on the Chakrata's Doxford. Putting nostalgia aside, it's time to return to my own filming of some quick sightseeing in Brisbane before sailing south for Newcastle. Every year or so, the old lady went into dry dock to have her bottom scraped and painted and to have essential maintenance done on her ship's side valves and anchors and cables.
With the dry docking completed, it's time to go alongside to load cargo, including second-hand cars destined for the Middle East. Located just one hour from Melbourne and tucked into 30 hectares of the foothills of the Yarra Valley is the Hillsville Sanctuary. It showcases more than 200 species of Australian wildlife and is a fantastic location to view the native animals in a natural habitat.
Loading cargo in Port Adelaide usually gave us time to explore Adelaide's hinterland, including another sanctuary in the Mount Lofty Ranges, about a 30 minute drive to the east of Adelaide. Are you trying to tell us you've got a platypus named Bill? Oh no, but I got a bill here for three platypuses. Oh, tie me kangaroo down, sport. Tie me kangaroo down, chills. Tie me kangaroo down, sport. Tie me kangaroo down. Take it, Bentley. Fly me didgeridoo, stew. Fly me didgeridoo. Too much. You can fly me didgeridoo, stew. Fly me didgeridoo. Oh, won't you fly me platypus down, stew. Victor Harbour is about 90 kilometres due south of Adelaide.
A visit to the Adelaide races in 1966 is the only time I've been to a racetrack and the only time I've placed a bet on a horse other than office-based Melbourne Cup sweeps. Needless to say, my horse won a place at the wrong end of the field. I come down there with my hat caved in, doo-da, doo-da. I go back home with a pocket full of tin, oh, the doo-da day. Gone to run all night, gone to run all day. I'll bet my money on the bobtail nag, somebody bet on the bay. Billy and the big black horse, do da, do da. They fly the track and they both cut across. Oh, the do da day. The blind horse sticking in a big mud hole, do da, do da. Can't touch bottom with a ten foot pole. Oh, the do da day. Gone to run all night, gone to run all day. I'll bet my money on the bobtail nag. Somebody bet on the bay. During one visit to Port Adelaide, I was working nights, so I teamed up with the other night working officers and the night shift nurses at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and headed to the Barossa Valley in a minibus loaned to us by the Flying Angel Missions to Seamen. Das um die Quelle tanzt, wenn ich den lieben Schenktisch seh und Gläser drauf gepflanzt. Heidi, Heida und Gläser drauf gepflanzt. Heidi, Heida und Gläser drauf gepflanzt. Des Abends spät, des Morgens früh trink ich mein Glas Krambambuli, Krambam, Bambuli, Krambambuli. 
des Abends, spät des Morgens, früh trink ich mein Glas Kambambuli, 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 soll mir noch munden, wenn jede andere Freude starb. Wenn mich Freund ein beim Glas gefunden und mir die Seligkeit verdarrt, trink ich mit ihm in Kompanie das letzte Glas Kambambuli, Kambam, Bam, Bambuli, Kambambuli. Trink ich mit ihm in Kompanie das letzte Glas Kambambuli, Kambam, Bam, Bambuli, Kambambuli. Kommt, Brüder, trinket froh mit mir, seht, wie die Wächter schäumen. Bei vollen Gläsern wollen wir ein Stündchen hier verträumen. Das Auge flammt, die Wange glüht, in kühneren Tönen rauscht das Lied, schon winkt der Götterwein. Schenkt ein, schenkt ein, schon winkt der Götterwein. Und was euch tief im Herzen wacht, das will ich jetzt begrüßen. Dem Liebchen sei dies Glas gebracht, der einzigen der Süßen. This great Australian bite storm was not typical of my many bite crossings between 1966 and 1968. It was rare that I saw sea spray over the bow and green water rolling up over the stern. With the Great Australian Bight and Fremantle behind us, we steamed northwest for the Persian Gulf, where the crew made good use of the typical fair weather to get some deck scaling done. Muscat was usually our first port of call after Australia. It lies to the southeast of the entrance to the Gulf and is a favoured spot for launching a lifeboat for some beach exploring. Ships personnel were not allowed ashore in the city.
There stood an unwritten challenge for ship's cadets to paint their ship's names on the highest possible point on the surrounding cliffs. Today, that would be considered graffiti or even vandalism. A short steam through the Straits of Hormuz took us to Dubai, our first port of call inside the Gulf. Dubai of the 21st century is very different to that of the 1960s. Then there were no land-backed berths, the all cargo was worked into local dhows while lying at anchor. Visits ashore for good value shopping were facilitated by small dhows engaged by the ship's agents to act as crew ferries. Dubai was, and I understand still is, a great place for value shopping and is certainly the place where most of our hi-fi sound gear, cameras and the like came from. Jazz and Miles was a popular retailer that sold almost everything. A search on the 2009 internet shows that it is now a major retailer in most of the major Gulf cities. With the shopping done, we had time to kill in the Carlton Hotel for a refreshing ale or three before heading back to the agent's office to catch the ferry back to the Jagrata. Back on the ferry, we ended up in Dubai Creek while waiting for Spike Foreman, the Chakrata's chief officer. Back on board, there was not much to do except party. What do you do with an open sailor? What do you do with an open sailor? Early in the morning. 
My first B.I. Christmas Day was spent alongside in Bahrain. Poetry appreciation has never been one of my strong points, so I had to muster all of my officer qualities to bear the very boring Christmas recitations by Spike Foreman. They seem to go on and on and on. Poetry finished, we headed to the dining room where the tables had been combined so that we could all sit together and, in good naval tradition, with the junior cadet seated at the head and the captain at the foot of the table.
Q8 was quite modern relative to some of its neighbours in that it had land back wharves. This made it easier to get ashore, but unfortunately there was always a queue of ships waiting to berth, necessitating sometimes up to two or even three weeks at anchor waiting for a berth. Gangway swimming and of course partying were popular pastimes. Drunken sailor, what do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Early in the morning, way up she rises, way up she rises, way up she rises. Early in the morning, put him in a long boat to the soap, put him in a long boat to the soap, put him in a long boat to the soap. Early in the morning, way up she rises, way up she rises, way. What do you do with an open set? Early in the morning, shave his belly with a rusty ring. In Iraq, the Euphrates and Tigris rivers of biblical fame combine and become the Shuttle Arab, and that then flows into the Persian Gulf. Basra, our last Gulf port of call, is about 60 nautical miles up the river. While in the river, at times, it is possible to look across the top of the date palms and see the superstructure of a ship that appears to be steaming through those palms.
Anchoring in the river was always a pain, as it was not wide enough to allow a ship to swing 180 degrees when the tide changed. This meant that engines were always on notice to provide 10 or 20 propeller revolutions to keep the ship's stern off the river bank every time the tide changed. The Dumra and her sister ship the Dwarka provided a regular passenger ship service between Bombay and the Gulf ports. They each carried about 60 cabin class passengers and 1,000 passengers on their decks. Basra will always remain etched in my memory, as it was there, while manoeuvring alongside, that our captain, Eddie Joss, collapsed and died on the bridge wing. We buried him the next day in the small Christian section of the Basra Cemetery. Because our radio room had been sealed by the authorities when we entered the river, and it was a weekend, it was not possible to notify his family in the UK until days after the funeral. Back on board, and with some of us still in our number 10s from the funeral, we had to shake off our sombre mood to celebrate the birthday of Spike Foreman's eldest daughter. Even in those days, security in Basra was pretty tight. Europeans were not top of the popularity list, so visits ashore were not common. However, it was possible to take time out in the swimming pool of the local British club. After our cargo discharge in Basra, we usually loaded dates for the Australian market and then headed out of the Gulf for Karachi. Taking photographs and film while lying at anchor outside of Karachi was possible, but was strictly forbidden within Karachi itself.
While waiting for a pilot at berth, we had two other BI ships keeping us company. The pilot is coming, so up with the pick. No he's not, so down with the other one. Is he coming to us? Is he? Yes, he is. Arrival off Bombay meant the inevitable anchoring and wait for a pilot.
Eventually, we got alongside and the locals came on board to reupholster our dining room chairs. It was also time for a crew change. Almost on the southwest tip of India is the port of Cochin. It was my favourite Indian port with minimal signs of poverty and no street beggars. Some put that down to the strong communist influence in that region. Riverbanks were lined with traditional dipping fishing nets that I understand are still in use today. The principal reason for our calls into Cochin was to load frozen prawns and frog's legs for the Australian market. The frog's legs were graded by the number to the pound. The largest I saw were number twos. This hotel in the middle of the island was one of our frequent haunts. It served delicious food including frog's legs, but it did take a strong stomach to retain one's dinner when on leaving the hotel you encountered locals with tilly lamps and gunny sacks catching frogs in the street drains. I wonder where those frogs were destined. <laughs> 